But look, let's start the program today with the review of the Reserve Bank. Before the last election, both sides of politics promised a review into the role and settings of our central bank. Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor welcomed the review, as did the RBA Governor Philip Lowe, who'd previously pushed for any review to be conducted by the Reserve Bank itself and Treasury. Jim Chalmers, though, went in a different direction. Review or no review, one thing is clear. The Reserve Bank is going to keep putting interest rates up. You know, we need higher interest rates. That level of interest rate is too low and we're going through a process now of um, steadily increasing interest rates and uh, there's more of that to come. That is a far cry from the Philip Lowe of eight months ago. Given the information we currently have to hand, it's still entirely possible that the cash rate will remain at its current level until 2024. I don't want this to be all about taking pot shots at the governor or the board. Uh, I don't want it to be primarily about second guessing decisions uh, that the board has taken, particularly in the recent past. The review will be broad sweeping. It'll be about the RBA culture, who it hires, who sits on the board, whether it measures the right things. They're not saying that publicly, they're welcoming it but that's not the RBA culture. The RBA tends to resist external engagement. What will be examined is its inflation target, now between 2 and 3%. It's been missed pretty much every year for the past eight years. The question I think has to be addressed is, is the 2 to 3% inflation target set up in the early 1990s the right thing to still have? And the reason I ask that is that it is higher than the rest of the world. And the RBA governor wants more wriggle room. In most other countries that have under-reviewed their inflation targeting arrangement, they've come to the conclusion that a flexible inflation target centred somewhere around the 2% uh, mark is, um, is the best we can do. Whatever the target, the RBA is on notice from the Prime Minister. You got rate settings wrong once, don't get them wrong this time around. The Reserve Bank will make its decisions based upon uh, the, their assessment of where the economy's at, but they need to be careful that they don't overreach uh, as well. Of course, the Reserve Bank declared a, a while ago, and they've, they've conceded the error, that interest rates would, would stay at the uh, extraordinarily low levels where they were uh, for a, a period of years, up to 2024, and that hasn't been the case. The future well-being of the Australian economy may well depend upon it. So let's bring in here John Quiggan, Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland and one of the country's most prominent economists. He was among a group of leading economists that called for a review of the Reserve Bank. In an open letter, those economists said the review needed to be led by someone from overseas for perspective, also needed to consider the RBA Act and its commitment to full employment, as well as the bank's structure and culture, how it communicates with the public, plus also the composition of its board appointments. John Quiggan, thanks for your time. Just to start off, did the Treasurer cover all of the points that you hoped for? He did. I think, I think the terms of reference are good and excluding things like APRO Prudential, you know, the Prudential Regulation Authority uh, is also a good move to, to focus on the key issues of um, how does the bank operate and is its current policy framework the right one? OK, so what motivated you to join that group of economists to call for this review in the first place? Well, I guess I've been... Uh, I've certainly been concerned that the inflation targeting regime uh, is really no longer fit for purpose. So, so I would certainly like to see that issue addressed. And, and in that context, we're much more to get an open discussion if the, if the panel, uh, the review panel, uh, has a great credibility of its own, some strong economists, rather than, for example, if it uh, had... <coughs> leading business people, for example, who might do a good job in many respects but wouldn't be equipped to challenge the, the views of the bank. So the Reserve Bank Governor this week uh, effectively said he wants a more flexible approach to inflation. Does he actually need more wriggle room or is it really a situation where, um, you know, the Reserve Bank should be bound to certain measures of inflation? Well, in my view, we, we need some fairly radical changes. We need to accept higher rates of inflation uh, than the 2 to 3% target, which was appropriate as a way of breaking inflationary expectations back in the, in the early 1990s. But now it doesn't leave enough room for monetary policy uh, when we have a shock by the COVID pandemic. We and everyone else went to zero. Uh, 
We would have liked to have rates lower than that, but of course you can't have a rate lower than zero. If we had a bit more inflation, we could have a real interest rate uh, a substantially lower than we had and more effective monetary policy. Uh, then there's a, a broader question of whether targeting an inflation number is the right way to go or whether we should be looking at uh, a measure which incorporates explicitly uh, both, both parts of the Reserve Bank's uh, uh, commitment to full employment of the economy and to uh, price stability, uh, something like the rate of nominal GDP growth, which would include a commitment, therefore, to have GDP growing at a rate consistent with full employment. I'll come back to full employment shortly because I want to talk about that, but I just want to go to one issue. The Treasurer this week said this would be no witch hunt of the Reserve Bank, but I just wonder whether the Reserve Bank should be beyond reproach. After all, did the Reserve Bank make mistakes over the course of the past 18 months or so? Well, I think, like nearly everybody, the Reserve Bank was surprised by, by the extent of inflation we had. I don't think... I don't think it's reasonable to uh, uh, reasonable to uh, single them out. Uh, nearly everybody got that wrong. Of course, no one predicted uh, the Ukraine war, which has uh, piled up more pressure. But also, no, I think uh, we're probably uh, uh, on the side of on the side of excessive expansion during the pandemic. Most countries were. Uh, that was the, the better mistake to make of the two compared to, for example, what happened after the global financial crisis. Um, it has left us with a fair bit of inflation to work through. Looking at the period before the pandemic, I think there's a pretty strong case that uh, interest rates were too high and unemployment was too low. There, I don't think... I think the issue really is uh, the model... <coughs> uh, the model of inflation targeting and the... Uh, the concept of the Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, that's behind that. Uh, so that, that general model, which has been adopted by the bank, Reserve Bank and other central banks, is the problem rather than specific areas by pe specific people within the bank. OK, so it was the Prime Minister wrong this week to identify that he thought the Reserve Bank had made mistakes and he was hoping it didn't overshoot effectively in raising interest rates or holding them too high for too long, therefore potentially damaging the economy in this uprising cycle? Well, I think it, it's fair to say most places, try, most central banks tried to keep interest rates too high in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and most of them failed. Uh, uh, that's a mistake we certainly want to avoid. But there's a separate question, of course, of uh, whether we're going to continue with the very strong separation we've had between the uh, the government and the central bank for the last 30 years, or go back to a situation uh, which prevailed before that, where uh, the official family, the uh, Treasury and Reserve Bank, and the government uh, work much more closely together to try and stabilise the economy. Uh, so, um, so we'll really have to see how that works out, and that's one issue I think the inquiry will have to address. OK, then come back to this wages issue because quite clearly there is a situation where the notion of full employment appeared to change. At one point it seemed to be something with a four in front of it, maybe the low fours, then all of a sudden it was something with a three in front of it. Um, is it really dangerous to try and get what you wish for with full employment? Because with an, in, uh, with a, an employment rate, unemployment rate of three and a half percent, of course, it puts pressure on inflation, on wages inflation, and of course skills shortages across the Australia? Well, we haven't, of course, seen any significant pressure on wage inflation. It's certainly true that if you have full employment, uh, another way of calling full employment is skill shortages, that when you have high unemployment, uh, you can put an ad in the paper and hire whoever you want if you're an employer. Uh, when, uh, when everybody's employed, uh, it's more difficult to hire staff. So in some sense, that's what full employment is. Uh, we have seen, I think, uh, well, not only four, but the estimated rate was above five for quite a while. And that, I think, does reflect uh, part of the danger of having a, a targeting policy that reflects only inflation and not uh, what's happening in the real economy. Good to have you on the program today. Many thanks for your time.